Good morning. How you all survive in the heat? Some of you are like, heat? What heat? So I know some of you love the heat. I'm not one of you. I melt. I have a question for you. Just as I had a question for the kids, I have a question for you. Uh, it's the actual title of the message today. What does Jesus want with you? What does Jesus want with me? You ever ask yourself, you hear that? Because if he is the good shepherd, if, if you're one of his sheep, what does your shepherd want with you? Obedience. Really? That's, that's what he wants. That's his desire of his heart. Among other things. Okay, what else? Depends. Dependence on him. Okay, I, I think the shepherd does want us to depend on him. Anything else? Say that again. Listen to his voice. I'm pretty sure he does want us to listen to his voice. That would be great. Glorify his name. Love. I think that's getting closer to the center of the bullseye there. Love. I'm going to give you the answer. The answer of what God wants with us, why he's done everything he's done, is for union with us. He wants us to be with him, and he wants us to be wanting to be with him. So he wants to be with us, and he wants us to want to be with him. He wants to be one with us. God wants union with us. And and I don't think we get that. We read chapters like John 15 in the Gospels, and we go, oh, that sounds so nice. And we don't really get that God actually intends to move into us and for us to move into him and to live our lives in him instead of in this world. There is a, a profound difference between living in Christ and living in this world. And I think if there's one problem we have, if I can speak in a generic sense of we, I'm not using the royal sense. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about all of us, okay? The difference is this. We live in this world like this world is our entertainment center, and we just get to play and enjoy and do whatever we want instead of living in this world with God and making him the center of our pleasure, that our love and our attention and our desires are focused and centered in him first. And that we would live our lives that way with our orientation very, very, very centered and focused and lived in Christ. And not in California or Hawaii or anywhere else. The, the difference is being a citizen of the United States versus being a citizen of North Korea or a citizen of hell. But every time we live our lives centered anywhere else, we're living as a citizen of North Korea or a citizen of hell. And the second problem is we don't see that. We see our own entertainment as its own good goal. That is one of the core values of our nation today. It's one of the reasons we have such deep problems. I'm not going there. But I think we can recognize we've got problems and it's because one of the key core values of our nation today, the United States today, is entertainment and what pleases me is the greatest good. It's the primary goal of life. What makes me feel good is the only thing that's good. That's the definition of idolatry. So what does my God want with me. Jesus' intention is in saving us is union with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John, John 6, 56, he who eats his flesh and drinks his blood abides in Christ and he in the disciple. This is one of the reasons that from day one, the church practiced communion daily. They didn't do it once a month because of the priority of making Christ the center and in sharing in his body and blood, sharing in not only his suffering, but his resurrection, sharing in Christ literally. John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, Jesus is the word. That's where we have life. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, because he knows we've got a choice in this matter. We have to choose how we think, 
how we feel, how we live. We choose these things. 300 choices a day, 3,000 choices a day, we choose. In John 14, 10 through 11, and John 14, 16 through 17, and John 14, 23, there is the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity of God is involved in this abiding process. The Trinity abides in each other, eternally so. God is eternal. He is self-existent. But it has always been God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And they making their home in each disciple if we obey and love him. This is God's desire that we would abide in him and he, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit would abide in us. That we make our hearts, our minds, our souls, our lives, the dwelling we you know, sleep in at night, that that would be the center of God himself in Sacramento, in your heart, your mind, your home. If we obey and love him. And then John 15, 1 through 10 as we abide in Christ, he makes this statement, we bear much more fruit. We don't, only, we don't only just bear fruit, we bear much more fruit in Christ. You can live a productive life in this world without, without God. You can. There's plenty of millionaires in this world that have no relationship with God at all. You can be productive, but Jesus said we'll bear much more fruit if we abide in him. And he makes a promise that the fruit will last. So you can have a $6 million house with 40 acres in the wine country of Sonoma. We saw this on the news late last night. There's multi-million dollar houses for sale in Sonoma right now. Get out your checkbook. But here's the thing. It will burn. You're not taking it to heaven. There's no such thing as a hearse going to the cemetery pulling a U-Haul. None of the toys we have here on this earth, none of the possessions we collect and cherish are going with us to heaven. But the deeds we do here by faith in Christ, all of those things last for eternity, including giving some cold Gatorade to someone who's thirsty. That's a deed of faith in Christ. So what does Jesus want with us? Union. Now that might sound like a cold, even clinical term, union. I want to make, make it just a little more personal, a little more real for you. Cheryl and I, my wife and I, dated for three and a half years. And we talked about marriage starting about month two of dating. But we were in college. And so Cheryl's father's wisdom, when I asked his permission to marry his daughter, he said, mm, I think you should both graduate college first, which killed me because we had two more years of college. And you should pay off all your bills first. And I was paying my own way through college, so I was going to have a few bills when I graduated. So graduate first and pay off all my bills. Dad was a wise man. That's good advice. God intervened. After we graduated college, we did graduate college first, and then we got married. But here's the thing. When you date for three and a half years, and you want to be together, when you finally do get married, when you go on your honeymoon, you're not thinking of separate vacations. You know what I'm saying. You're looking forward to being together. We enjoyed our honeymoon. We had a week of just being together with each other. We did not go on a honeymoon with, you know, a party of people. It was just Cheryl and I. We didn't take her mom with us. We didn't, we didn't take my mom with us. Love you, mom, but you weren't invited. It's just me and Cheryl, right? And you, you all get this. You're smiling. That's what God wants with us. When I use the word union or communion, God wants to be with you in the most loving, personal, intimate way. And he wants you to have that same desire for him. Is there anything in this world you desire more than being with God? If there's anything you desire more than being with God, 
you need to ask God for help because you have an idol in your life. God wants to be one with us. And he made it clear to all of his followers in very graphic ways. People that were shepherds and farmers would understand this. Jesus said you can only follow him by entering the narrow gate. And last week I talked about how we have to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. He made that comment too. But in Matthew 7, 13 to 14, he said, enter by the narrow gate. When you have cattle going into a semi-truck these days, cattle, sheep, goats, whatever you're taking to the market, whatever you're taking to the state fair, whatever you're doing with your animals, you don't put them on a ramp that's you know, 18 feet wide. You put them into a stall that's literally so narrow that only that animal can get through it barely, can barely wedge its shoulders and head through that ramp, that melt, those metal sides into the truck. You don't want the animal having an inch of room to you know, turn to the left or right. They can only go in one direction through the narrow gate. And that's exactly what Jesus intends for us. As he's the good shepherd, he wants us to follow him through the narrow gate, not turning to the left or the right. Jesus said in John 10, 9, I am the door. Jesus himself is the door. He is the narrow gate. And what makes it narrow, what makes it difficult, is that it's the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 to 18, verses 23 to 24, chapter 2, verse 2, the cross is the heart of the gospel and the power of God. Please turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 17 to 18. For Christ did not send me, Paul, to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, not like a televangelist on TV or the Internet, that the cross of Christ should not be made void. The cross of Christ is central. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to everyone being saved, it, the cross, is the power of God. Verses 23 and 24. We preach Christ crucified. That's the narrow gate. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are being called, the called, those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. In chapter 2, verse 2, I, Paul, determined to know, to experience among you nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Is that your desire when you come to worship? To experience Christ and him crucified. Crucifixion is a horrible thing. It is painful, it is suffering, it is torture. And I don't think I ever get up in the morning wanting to come here and be with you on a Sunday morning or any other time we get together and want to suffer torture and horror. I don't have that desire to you. So doesn't that sound like some kind of a strange verse that God would give us, that God would speak to us this eternal living word that has those words in there, that I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. The way to eternal life in union with God has nothing to do with the ways of this world. The way of this world, Jesus said earlier in the same context, he talked about the narrow gate. He said, I'm the gate. The way to me is narrow. The way to hell is broad. It's a super highway of 10 lanes. It's an autobahn of 10 lanes. You can go as fast as you want down this highway to hell. And the world even makes songs about it. But it's not funny. Narrow is the way. Narrow is the gate. It's about as narrow as that cross. That's pretty narrow. 
But that's what Jesus intends for each one that would come to him. Each one that wants and desires and hungers, thirsts for union with God more than anything in this world. Our healing, our forgiveness, our salvation, our greatest joy and fulfillment and fruitfulness is only in Christ. And the only way we get there is entering that narrow gate of picking up our cross and following Jesus, of living his life, not the world's imitation of life. The world is always advertising and trying to get our attention and trying to woo our hearts and minds away from God. How much attention are we giving the world and how much attention are we giving Jesus? Is Jesus literally the greatest love of our minds and our hearts? That your mind and heart would be one in this, by the way. You don't just think an occasional thought of God or think or feel an occasional feeling of God, but your mind and heart would be one in this. And that with your whole being, you'd be loving God, desiring God, hungering God, thirsting for him morning, noon, and night. That he would be the center of that's union with God. Now, I'm not going to ask you right now, how are you doing with that? I'm not going to ask you that. I think the Holy Spirit's already asking you that, and you could answer him. You could answer God when he asks you, how are you loving me? How are you hungering me? How are you desiring me? How are you abiding in me? How is your union with me going today? The great news is, if we even turn to him a little bit, he'll help us turn to him more. If we repent a little bit, he'll help us repent more. God is merciful. God is gracious. Our good shepherd's always trying to help round up those loose sheep. And from time to time, we're all one of those loose sheep. We all sin. We all stumble in many ways. But First John tells us if we confess our sins and repent from our sins, he is what? Faithful. Faithful. Amen to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We can pray Psalm 51 every morning. Pray for God to wipe us clean, make us whiter than snow, make our hearts and minds and souls absolutely pure and holy in Christ and with Christ. We can experience this holiness, this union, this love, this joy, this peace 24-7. That is God's plan. That is God's desire. We're the ones that interrupt it. We're the ones that are the sheep that tries to get out of the pen. We think, oh, this looks so much better over there, Lord. That, that clover on the other side of that electric fence looks so good. Let me just, you know, bump up against that electric fence a few times. Ouch! And yet we keep doing it. And we wonder, where is God? Why don't I hear his voice? Have you noticed God doesn't yell at us too often? Have you noticed that? God usually speaks like he did to the prophet Elijah with a, a very small whisper. Now, this is God whispering, so even his whisper is enough to move a mountain. But the further we get away from God, the the harder it's going to be here, that whisper. And anytime we have anything else in our heart that we love more than God, it gets harder to hear that whisper. God's desire is union with us. And it doesn't, his plan is not for that to start the moment we get into heaven. God's plan is for us to live in this here and now. That we would be his people here before we're his people there. He wants us to live here exactly like we are already living there. That's his plan. We have union with him here, not just in heaven. The union you're going to have with God in heaven will literally be face to face, eyeball to eyeball. I mean, I can look you right in the eye here and you can't see Jesus looking eyeball to eyeball right now. You, you don't see him right now. You're looking at me. So that will be one little change. 
But the reality of Christ here now is already here, already real, already supernaturally powerful. And the reality of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit wanting to abide in you is already here, already real, already now. God is not waiting for us to get to heaven. His desire is for us to want to live in him and with him here now. As if we're in heaven. But here on this earth, living by faith, trusting, loving, and obeying him here now. So in light of that, I want to give you a little gift and I want you to think about this gift, pray about this gift, and please give me feedback. I want your opinions. I've been talking to groups in our church about this for a couple of months. I think going on three months now. And so maybe you've already heard this or seen this. And this has gone through a couple different versions, a couple different editing, where I'm taking input from all of you. And so we as a church are going to come up with our reason for being. Why is Southside here? Now, obviously, this whole sermon won't fit in a purpose statement, right? So we can't just say, well, we're going to have all these scriptures and all these. No, no, no. We're going to make it one sentence. We're going to keep it simple. Why are we here? If you could explain this to any person who does not yet know Jesus, do you think this would make sense to them? We are here to make disciples. What's not stated is of Jesus Christ. We're here to make disciples and improve our community by living the cross in the transforming love of Jesus. I think that's a good reason, a good statement for why we're here. Now, our church has a mission statement, and it's three pages long. That's why none of you know it. I don't blame you. So I want to reduce it down to a bullseye, like a laser pointer bullseye, for all of us to be able to clearly articulate anywhere, anytime. Why is Southside Community Church here? And so I've given you this. It's in your sermon notes. And I invite you, take this home and pray about it. Change it up. If there's a word you want to add or take away, please do. Because I want the Holy Spirit to give us unity in this from God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That we would know why we're here together. We would have one purpose for being here. Not 37 different purposes. Just one. So please take this home. Pray about it. Play with it. Enjoy it. Seek the mind of God. Seek the Holy Spirit. Listen to your good shepherd. See what he thinks of this statement. Southside Community Church is here to make disciples and improve our community by living the cross in the transforming love of Jesus. So that all of us can have union with Jesus and know him as he truly is. Amen? I want to thank you for everything we've been able to do here today to glorify Jesus Christ. I loved the kids taking that offering for Israel. Uh, may we help the kids do more with us in here. Amen. Help them grow to love and know and serve Jesus with us. If you have any questions about that purpose statement, feel free to contact me here at the church. You can call me. You can send me an email. Talk to me next Sunday. Stop in and say hi. You're invited. Okay. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for making it clear to us that your greatest desire is union with us. For us to know you and live with you. And for you to know us and live with us, even closer than a married couple. Lord, may you grow that love, your holy love for us. Grow that in our hearts and minds and souls, even in our bodies, so that we have such an awareness of you such a, a tremendous holy feeling of you, a, a knowledge of you that everything else would just not be important, that you would be most important. Lord, help us to love you as much as you love us according to the power and glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great week. Walk with Jesus in the fullness of his love for you. Amen.